sad news. Did you hear on the radio today that Freddy the Elephant died yesterday? No, I didn't hear that. Who is or was Freddy anyway? Freddy was that famous elephant that saved a lost puppy from drowning years ago. He was apparently very bright. The story goes that the young pup got away from his owner and found his way into Freddy's pen. Now the puppy, being a puppy, fell into the pond and would have drowned if Freddy didn't scoop him up with his trunk. He did this amazingly heroic act in front of a bunch of school kids visiting the zoo. So you can bet he had an automatic fan base from that day onward. What a cute story. However, I must say I really hate the whole concept of zoos. Freddy should have been left to roam with his buddies in Africa. I know what you mean, but what about all those city kids who never get to experience nature? Don't you think it's good for them to be exposed to the animal kingdom? Perhaps it teaches children to respect nature. I still have to disagree. Zoos and petting zoos have been around for years. Animal species are still going extinct at alarming rates. I think it's an outdated idea. Why should human beings have the power to cage up wild animals? We separate them from their families for the sheer pleasure of entertainment, sometimes packaging it up as an educational element. Even that suggestion that we have these zoos to protect a species seems bogus to me. I think it's inhumane. Also, many animals in zoos die earlier in captivity than in their wild habitat. They are sometimes neglected and exposed to weird viruses. You really present a convincing argument. But what about Freddy's heroic act? It's a neat story, and it tells me that animals are really intelligent and don't deserve to live and die in zoos. They should be living with their own species in the wild. Unit 1. Learning Disability. Please listen carefully. Now listen to part of a lecture in an education class. There are students who do well in some areas of learning, but not in others. It can be very frustrating for the student, teacher, and parents. If a student can progress quickly in one subject, but struggles to grasp another, then there is a possibility the student may have a learning disability. Testing can determine if there is a specific learning disability or not. It is, however, important to remember that it is a specific learning disability and the child is still of normal intelligence, but just needs support in the area of difficulty. A learning disability occurs when messages that need to be sent to the brain do not get there, or the brain cannot interpret the message. There can be many causes for this, including genetics, pre-birth or birthing complications, poor nutrition, illnesses, and head injuries. Sometimes the reason may never be known. The most important thing is that the weakness is identified. There are five areas that can be affected. Spoken language, written language, arithmetic, reasoning, and memory. Testing will confirm the specific learning disability. This is a crucial step because once the weakness is identified, then support must be given to the individual to understand the disability and learn strategies to cope and hopefully overcome it. Having a learning disability diagnosed is not a label or obstacle. Rather, it is an opportunity to understand and find ways to work around or bypass it. Many of us have learning disabilities, but just are not aware of them as we instinctively developed coping strategies. Special education teachers are employed by school boards to assist students who are having such difficulties. Parents who chose not to have this support for their children are doing them a great disservice. Such teachers are highly skilled and knowledgeable about such matters and should be recognized and used as a resource for parents to find ways to help their children. How does the professor describe what a learning disability is and what does she suggest can be done to deal with it? Organizing. Unit 2, Tourism. Please listen carefully. Now listen to part of a lecture in a tourism class. Tourism is both positive and negative for underdeveloped countries. It helps solve some problems, 
but replaces those problems with new ones which cannot be ignored. Underdeveloped areas such as the Caribbean and parts of Southeast Asia are becoming the vacation spots for developed nations. Airlines, hotel chains, travel agencies, etc. have made travel easy by developing package tours. This type of travel is simple. Everything is organized from the moment of leaving home, arrival at the hotel, food and beverages, entertainment in the hotel, optional trips outside the hotel, to return back to home. This is great for the tourist and the vacation country earns money. However, what price does that country pay? In an effort to develop the country and help the people, governments have to provide certain things, airports, roads, water, and electricity, not to mention land given for the project. Local people do find employment, but the pay is often low. The good-paying jobs usually go to people from foreign countries who were brought in to run the resorts. People have said that although these vacation spots are financially beneficial for the host countries, they have wondered if this type of environment that caters mostly to foreign nationals is something that is desirable or not. Local customs and life in general are often affected negatively by entertainment, foreign habits, and the lust for money. The local economy built around the hotel is at the mercy of the tourist industry. It is easily affected by a number of factors which include the desirability of the location, locale, national and international events, changing weather patterns, etc. Tourism is neither all good nor all bad, and it needs to be handled very carefully by the host country. The professor states the advantages and disadvantages of tourism. Summarize how the professor explains them. Unit 3. Photography. Please listen carefully. Now listen to part of a lecture in a photography class. For a time before 1932, professional photographic images were softened because it was the fashion of the time. Photographs were romanticized and tended to look more like paintings and prints than photographs. Several photographers joined together to form a society, later to be called Group F-64, which had the mandate to take photographs which were clear and sharp. Images were to have clean lines, depth, and be printed on smooth, glossy printing paper. The photographic process was meant to produce a quality product. Group F-64 was organized in 1932 by Ansel Adams, Edward Weston, Willard Van Dyke, Imogene Cunningham, and others. Adams was actually the nucleus of the group. He studied photography and music until 1930 when he decided to concentrate fully on photography. The objective of the group was to provide a platform for photographers who took photographs in such a way. Photographs were to be pure, that is to say they were not to be posed or contain any art form. The methodology was to produce photographs which were an art form in themselves. The group influenced the direction of American photography. Group F-64 selected members who worked within guidelines established by the group. It presented the work of its members in shows along with prints by other photographers with similar photographic style as the members. The name Group F-64 was chosen because F-64 is the smallest aperture on the lens of a large format camera, the one that will capture the greatest depth in a photograph. The professor discusses a photography group called Group F-64. Summarize his lecture. <laughs> 